Hello there and welcome to Complete Games with me James. Hope you guys are all doing well and we continue with part 2 of Helena's Explorer Notes. If you missed my previous video, go and check that one out before you continue here as we're discussing the complete journey of all of the survivors across the island map and finish off Helena's journey in part 2. Of all the abnormalities I've observed, the tamed megalodons stick out to me. It's almost like there were stray dogs who were re-socialized, as though they had a genetic history of human obedience. Most of my observations have been in the wild, but I think I might learn a thing or two if I observe domesticated creatures more closely. I need to study their diets, their mating patterns, how they socialize with other species, all that. Rumor has it some woman has tamed a whole mass of them, all by herself. So many they call her the beast queen of the jungle. Maybe she'll have some useful insights. I suppose it was a bit naive of me to think someone with the moniker of Beast Queen would roll out the red carpet. I guess I got used to all the friendly treatment that being an associate of Rockwell's earned me. She did let me stay at least, and she hasn't instructed her dinosaurs to kill me yet. So that's positive. Not that she'll really need the dinosaurs if that glare of hers gets any more intense. I'll probably burst into flames on the spot. Struth, I hope she eases up. Shifting through raptor excrement with someone watching is harder than you might think. There's nothing special about the diets of these tame creatures when compared to their wild counterparts. Part of that is the Beast Queen's doing. She takes them on regular hunting excursions for training purposes. Curiously, they never have to range too far. There's an abundance of prey nearby, despite the size of her pack that this is held true regardless of the domesticated creature's remarkable birth and growth rates makes it even more unusual. Oh, and I finally did get her name, Mei Yin. She's got a little less glary too. In hindsight, maybe starting by studying her animal's feces just gave the wrong impression. The most interesting thing that I've observed about Mei Ying's animals has been what they don't do. They never fight. Among creatures that have been domesticated for generations like cats and dogs, that's normal, but there's a reason zoos keep their animals in separate enclosures. Certain instincts are hard to curb, and there should definitely be more disputes among such a diverse group. Mei Yin has even integrated a herd of herbivores into her army, as their fixed hides have proven resistant to fire and explosives. Yet despite being surrounded by carnivores, they remain untouched. It doesn't make sense. That's not to take anything away from Mei Yin. She works hard to treat and train her animals well. She's not bad company either, at least when she's not a mute and I don't go full biologist. Sometimes it felt like speaking a new language, but it's been kind of refreshing. After going over my notes from Mei Yin's camp, I've concluded that all the animals on the island are not only used to humans, but used to captivity. Even with their accelerated growth rates, their behaviour indicates they've been regularly domesticated for decades at least. Otherwise, they'd never obey the whims of mankind so easily. With that in mind, I believe my theories about the island being curated is back in play. In fact, it's possible that not only are animal populations being controlled, that the animals themselves are genetically modified. However, before I bring this to Rockwell, there's one more rumour that I want to confirm. This is the smoking gun. It has to be. I simply can't be convinced that this place is natural after finding an island populated entirely by carnivores. Even if they fed off each other, which is awfully dubious given that carnivore meat is much more likely to carry harmful parasites than herbivore meat, the landmass is so small and their population is so dense that it could never maintain it. Yet, there it is, hidden away on the northeast coast of the islands. Someone would have to put them there on purpose. There's no way Rockwell can deny my theory now. As I expected, Rockwell couldn't deny my theory, but I can't say that I have his endorsement either. He didn't seem terribly engrossed in the subject. Frankly, something else seems to have captured his attention as of late. The island's obelisks. Apparently Rockwell stumbled upon a way to interact with the towering monuments while spelunking of all things. I guess he felt the need to scratch that old intemperate explorer itch of his. It's pretty impressive, considering his age. Now that I think about it, the obelisk could be linked to my own findings. Their nature has always been a mystery, and Rockwell made some intriguing observations. 
I should follow up. Though I've been received by the Iron Brotherhood, they didn't seem very pleased to see me, especially when I mentioned Rockwell. That's a first. And the rather deserted, gloomy state of their compound. I'm starting to feel a bit apprehensive. Their leader can't return from his hunting expedition soon enough. All I've confirmed so far is that yes, they gathered all the artifacts Rockwell sought out, and yes, the artifacts were able to activate one of the obelisks. You think they'd be celebrating such a monumental discovery, but it's just killjoys as far as the eye can see. Go figure. I keep glancing at the artifact. I understand why the Iron Brotherhood's leader didn't want it, since it has no apparent use, and all it does is remind him of the tribesman who died seizing it from the giant spider. Can it really be useless though? They described the artifacts that activated the obelisk as looking similar to it, so I headed to the nearest obelisk to see if I could get a response. No luck. Maybe it activates something else. Of course, the platform in the cave. It's a long shot, but the only thing I can think of that's similar to the obelisks. Definitely worth a try. Unbelievable, the artifacts perfectly fit one of the slots in the platform's pedestal. How did I not notice that right away? I really am a dipstick. So if this key, such as it is, was acquired by activating one of the obelisks, then it follows that the other two keys can be obtained by activating the other two obelisks. Then, with all three keys, maybe this platform will lead to whatever is controlling the island's ecosystem. If the other obelisks work the same way the first one did, that means I have to find a whole mass of artifacts first. I don't think I can do that alone. Well, the Howling Wolves are quickly tracking down the artifacts, but after hearing about what's happened to the Iron Brotherhood, that's as far as they'll go. It's understandable, but it leaves me in a tight spot. If a giant spider and I get in a scrap, the spider's winning for sure. Even with Athena on my side, I prefer to avoid danger, not confront it. My aim's piss poor and I've got fists like marshmallows. If I want a fair go at actually surviving whatever happens when the obelisk activates, I need backup. Now I don't know you get the nickname like Beast Queen without being one tough lady, but when I saw that giant ape, I still thought we were buggered. Fortunately, Mi Yin's got more intestinal fortitude than yours truly, and somehow, some way, she was able to pull out a win. Glad I'm on her good side. I already found the second key, but I want to take a look around here before we head back through the portal. This ape either lived here or was released when we activated the obelisk. Finding out how it survived in this isolated environment, or how it got here, could prove useful. So, these are the consequences that I heard about way back when. Not a great first impression. Mi Ying and I weren't quite mates, but watching her creatures get slaughtered like that certainly wasn't pleasant. I'm not a fan of the prisoner lifestyle either. The leader introduced himself as Gaius Marcellus Nerva. He's not a complete bogan, I'll give him that. He let me keep my personal effects, and our conversations have been quite civil so far. I'll get the feeling that that'll change if I don't cooperate though. Not that I have much choice. They already took the keys, the only way I'm seeing this through is as a guest of the new legion. This Nerva bloke's fig jam incarnate. He seems to think he's Jupiter's gift to the island or some rubbish like that. I think his ego was also actually tangible when the legion returned from the obelisk with the third key and the head of the dragon in tow. Sadly, as much as I'd enjoy seeing him fall flat on his face, I need him. And I need the new legion. So when he asked me to guide his forces to the hidden cave, I obliged without protest. What he'll do with me afterwards, I don't know. When Nerva and his band return from that cave, they'll decide my fate. So this may be my final chance to reflect. I may as well take advantage of it. I realise, had I just ignored the signs accepted this paradise at face value, I'd still be happy and free. Would that have been better? I don't think so. After a lot of thought, I've decided that I'd rather die seeking the truth than living in an illusion. That, as Rockwell would say, is the path of a true scientist. Not that I'm Galileo battling the church or anything, but hey, it's something to hold on to. Well, I'm not dead. As it turns out, neither was Mei Ying. In fact, it was her who freed me and insisted we follow Nerva through the portal into the cave. A horrifying scene awaited us. 
all of Nerva's men lay dead amongst shards of mysterious steel and metal, but Nerva's body was missing. Forgetting my present company, I suggested a peaceful approach if we encountered him. That earned me a hell of a knockout punch. When I came to, I searched the whole station, but the only signs of Mei Ying and Nerva were a few ounces of dried blood. No bodies, no victor. There, floating outside the window, and surrounded by machinery was the very island that I'd been living on. And it too was orbited high above the earth, along with countless other stations just like it. The ecosystem on the island wasn't just created, it was completely artificial from the ground up. What the hell is this? Why would anyone construct it? How could they have possibly kept it hidden from the world? I don't have the answers to any of these questions or the dozens of others that keep popping into my head, but somehow, I mean to find out. Somehow, I'll find the truth. Thank you very much for watching. Don't forget to comment down below if you've enjoyed me reading the Explorer Notes. In the next episode of my Explorer Notes reading from the island map, we'll be discussing Sir Edmund Rockwell, a chemist from the 19th century who's responsible for the recipes and consumables that we pick up in the island map. We'll follow his story and see how he contributed to the island. But until next time, I'm James from Complete Games and I'll see you.